testimony on evolving workforce dynamics and challenges for defense acquisition and defense industrial base personnel. This committee has spent several years examining the various challenges for our defense acquisition system. We have worked to identify supply chain problems, to pinpoint shortages in critical materials, and to improve investments in long lead items for our weapon systems. However, there is nothing more important for our defense acquisition strategy than our workforce. The men and women of the Defense Acquisition Corps and the personnel in the defense industrial base whom they help to guide and oversee. We cannot solve our acquisition problems without an adequate supply of skilled and trained workers. This challenge is spread through many sectors of our defense industrial base and in many geographic areas. From my own Rhode Island perspective, I often see the workforce challenging facing the submarine industrial base and the textile industry. These sectors each have their own unique hiring challenges, but those are further exacerbated by widespread competition for talent among federal agencies, between the federal government and the private sector, and even between the defense industrial base and the rest of the commercial sector. During today's hearings, we will take a step back to better understand the broader dynamics at play and consider how the Department of Defense can or should adapt its hiring and retention processes to try to address these challenges. Until we thoroughly identify and understand the changes happening in the broader workforce, we will not be able to properly meet them. Many of the defense workforce strains are related to demographic changes as more millennial and Generation Z workers enter the workforce, and many of our baby boomers, who have been the backbone of the defense workforce for decades, begin to exit in greater numbers. The younger generations have different demands and expectations of their employers than previous generations, especially in the post-COVID landscape. I am concerned that the Department has not fully recognized this evolution and has not fully adapted its talent management practices as a result. The sources of these labor challenges are diverse. Two-thirds of Americans who lost their full-time job during the pandemic say they are only somewhat active or not very active at all in searching for a new job. About half are not willing to take jobs that do not offer the opportunity for remote work. And we know that younger Americans are prioritizing their personal growth over searching for a job, with many saying that they're more focused on acquiring new skills, education, or training before re-entering the job market. To discuss these issues and help us better understand how the Department of Defense can adapt its hiring and retention policies, I would like to welcome our distinguished panel of witnesses. Mr. Johnny Taylor is the President and CEO of the Society for Human Resources Management. Ms. Taylor's career spans more than 20 years as a lawyer, human resources executive, and CEO in both the profit and not-for-profit sector. He is a global leader on the future of employment, workplace culture, and leadership. Dr. Simon Johnson is the Ronald A. Kurtz Professor of Entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School of Management. He is the co-author of the book, Jump Starting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. Dr. Johnson was previously a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, a member of the Congressional Budget Office's Panel of Economic Advisors, and a member of the Financial Research Advisory Committee of the U.S. Treasury's Office of Financial Research. Dr. Julie Lockwood is the Director of Business Modernization at the Institute for Defense Analysis, or IDA, an economist with expertise in labor, health, and computational economics. Dr. Lockwood built and led the human capital group within IDA, a team of researchers that use data analytics, machine learning, and applied econometrics to address Department of Defense personnel and readiness issues. And we're grateful to have such an accomplished panel of experts with us to discuss this important issue. Thank you again to our witnesses, and we certainly look forward to your testimony. Uh, let me now recognize Frank and Member Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Department of Defense employs more than 700,000 civilians who ensure that our military personnel are capable of performing their mission. Their mission is to deter and win wars to protect our national security. For this reason, the Armed Services Committee takes a special interest in ensuring that the Department of Defense has every tool necessary to build a civilian workforce that is capable, innovative, and dedicated to keeping our country safe. The basic principles of building an effective workforce are simple. The Department of Defense needs to be able to hire the best people quickly and pay them what they're worth. 
But if an employee does not meet expectations, the department needs to be able to dismiss that employee and find someone better. Unfortunately, the laws and regulations governing the Department of Defense workforce are anything but simple and efficient. Hiring takes too long, even when Congress provides accelerated direct hiring authority. Pay is often inadequate, especially in trade provisions such as welders and electricians who maintain the Navy's nuclear-powered submarines and carriers. The department also does not pay competitive salaries for jobs that require extensive formal education. And everyone knows how hard it is to terminate an underperforming employee. Those who spend any, any length of time in the Pentagon have a story of an underperforming colleague who was shuffled around to various offices to get him out of the way. Similarly, most know a, a truly exceptional performer who left the Department of Defense in search of better rewards for her hard work. The status quo is unacceptable. And the evidence is everywhere we look. Our public shipyards struggle to attract skilled trade workers. The Navy is hemorrhaging the civilian mariners whose work ensures the delivery of critical supplies around the world to the rest of the fleet. We cannot hire or retain enough doctors or nurses to staff our military hospitals. Cyber professionals leave the Department of Defense in droves to join other government agencies or the private sector. I could go on. The unique mission of the Department of Defense demands that Congress provide its, its exceptional authorities to allow the department to build the civilian workforce needed to support our war fighters. The system that governs every other federal agency is inadequate for our national defense workforce. Numerous bipartisan commissions and our military's senior leaders agree. I hope we can use this year's National Defense Authorization Act to provide legislative tools to achieve the basic principles of an effective civilian workforce. I would ask the witnesses to help us understand the weaknesses of the department's current human resource system. But more importantly, I hope the witnesses can tell us what we can do to make the Department of Defense a more competitive employer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Worker. Um, Mr. Taylor, please begin. The state of the workforce, thank you. Um, Sherman powers people and workplaces by advancing human resources practices and maximizing human potential. We're 75 years old this year, and we've been the trusted authority on all things work, workers, and the workplace. Our nearly 340,000 HR professionals across the globe represent nearly 362 million workers and their families in 180 countries. A few weeks ago, Sherm released its State of the Workplace report, which focused on the challenges employers uh, faced in 2023 and the critical issues we expect that they will face in 2024 and beyond. The report looks at four key areas which impact the workplace. First, balancing inflation and talent challenges. Yes, we want to pay our people more, but somehow the consumer is pushing back increasingly on paying more for services and goods. Training and evolving workforce, indeed, both Chairman Reed and Ranking Member Wicker spoke to the challenges of, for the first time, we've had five generations in the workplace at once, and they have significantly different needs. Thirdly, we looked at realizing the full potential of artificial intelligence. Quite the debate these days, and I'll spend more time in the, my introductory comments addressing that. And then we're struggling with engaging workers. So it's just not enough to have the bodies there, but to engage them is yet a significant challenge. I'd like to talk for just a minute about key findings from our report. One is inflation was the top concern for organizations in 2023, and not just general inflation, but indeed wage inflation. 73% of HR professionals indicated that this is their current number one concern. We want the talent, we want to pay them, but we've got to figure out how to do so. Secondly, labor shortages. 
They're another, and they were the number two issue in 2023. We've all read it. Somewhere between 8, 9, 10, 11 million open jobs at any given time, and that's created a major concern for organizations. More than two-thirds of employers have said, we simply can't find enough people. There are labor shortages. And then we need to reduce the cost and increase efficiencies. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that's directly uh, led to adoption of AI and other technologies. Nearly nine in 10 workers believe fair compensation from current employees, including the government, Department of Defense, for example, should be the top priority for organizations in 2024, yet only 27% of HR executives say this is their top priority, so a major disconnect. And a quarter of HR departments are currently using artificial intelligence applications for specific purposes, such as recruiting talent, employee training, and development. So in 2024, we expect that number will significantly be increased. And finally, improving people managers, that is the people leaders, understanding of their roles and developing more of their what we call soft skills, they're not so soft, power skills, such as empathy. Top organizational priorities for 2024 are all about not just getting the talent, or retaining the talent. And what our data tells us overwhelmingly is that 60% or more of employees leave not the employer, but their, their manager, their people manager, and thus the challenge for us. So let's talk about the labor shortages that we're all seeing and are specifically impacting the Department of Defense. HR de departments are being compelled to strategize to solve for the labor shortages with a market that does not want to respond in traditional ways. A key focus in the past was increased salary, and that will help you attract talent. Well, what we know about the younger generation is that doesn't necessarily work. Our data will tell us that employees will say they will actually leave an employer for less money, to go make less money if they get to work for a more empathetic leader. This is the reality of Generation Z and millennials and something we have to take into consideration at the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense can greatly benefit by retraining and retaining officers and enlisted personnel who leave the military and are having difficulty finding work in the private sector. This is a significant conversation in the private sector world, I can tell you, is how do we create opportunities? How do we translate the experiences of people who've come from the military and from the Department of Defense into private sector jobs? But that creates an opportunity for the DOD because, in fact, you might consider keeping those people. But returning alone is not enough. We need to train them and train these employees to be more adaptable. Because in today's rapidly changing world, adaptability is paramount. And SHRM research indicates that over 31% of organizations are modifying their recruitment strategies, including enhancing social media presence, advertising, and employee re referrals. So in summary, got a lot more to tell you, but uh, Sherm's testimony today underscores several pivotal areas where organizations can concentrate their efforts to attract, retain, and empower the workforce. Very quickly, adopt skills-based hiring, invest in retention, leverage apprenticeship programs, modernize talent management processes. This is, uh, Mr. Wicker, Senator Wicker, a real challenge for the government. And we need to invest in people managers, upskill and reskill the workforce, create a culture of learning. The employees want this. They don't want to take the job and know the job for 30 years and then retire. Create AI responsibly. It's not enough to just en en enable the technology, but to do so responsibly. And then the focus on human and machine collaboration. At Sherm, we speak a lot about AI plus HI will equal the new ROI. So it's not a sum zero game for employees. We've got to embrace this technology, and we think there are huge opportunities for the Department of Defense. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Dr. Johnson, please. Mm. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'd like to make three points. Uh, the first is about a term that I, I, I fear you're going to hear increasingly, uh, which is stranded expertise. It's a term being used in the tech sector to refer to the impact of AI in particular. But of course, it's not a new problem. We've been facing issues with expert people, people who, who spend a lot of time acquiring education and training, losing opportunities, and being left behind. These have been a problem since at least uh, the wave of automation. We've experienced this since the 1980s. The shock of Chinese imports from the early 2000s um, exacerbated this. And in the age of AI, I think we're going to be seeing much more of this. And of course, it's overlaid, uh, Senator Reid, with the, some of the um, issues you've talked about in terms of the, the demographics. I would also highlight the shift of innovation away from the historical dispersion in the United States towards the east and west coast. Um, 
And, and of course, from, from a broader social economic point of view, this is a problem. But my second point is um, that this is actually an opportunity for the Department of Defense and, and, and a way to think about uh, responding to the problems both you, Senator Reid, and Senator Wicker already flagged. Because the, the, the key point is that in, innovation and, and technology develops and is maintained in, in, in particular geographies around hubs. And we used to have a lot of hubs of, uh, that were very dynamic in the United States. Now we have fewer. But that can be addressed. There, the, the analysis we did suggests there's over 100 urban areas in 36 states where 80 million Americans live that are ripe for stepping up to become fantastic places for exactly the kind of problems that, that you're trying to solve and, and address on, on this committee. So there is potentially available labor. Uh, so there are already skills. There is no doubt some retraining needed and some repositioning. Of course, one of the problems with apprenticeship programs in the United States, one of the reasons the private sector doesn't um, frankly speaking, love them, is they're afraid that once you train a worker, that worker leaves and goes to work for a competitor. But if the goal is to strengthen the defense industrial base, and if people are sticky because we've all become less mobile, modern Americans are much less mobile than our predecessors, then if you're training people in a particular area to work on submarines, for example, or to acquire welding skills and electrical skills that are relevant to the submarine business, and they leave to a related enterprise in that area, you've not weakened the defense industrial base, you've actually strengthened and deepened its ties in that community. You've also, of course, got a reserve workforce that can be pulled in if you need to uh, increase, increase those activities. I think, the, from, from what I understand, Rhode Island, Senator Reid, you've got some terrific um, hub-based developments, but we're seeing this all around the country, and the Chips and Science Act, which was passed on a bipartisan basis, I think included um, affirmation of the importance of this as, as a general policy approach, but also something I would say that the, the DOD can take on board. Included, in, however, in that approach, Senator Reid would be addressing one of the key points you made, which is labor force participation. So it's not enough to have the opportunities. People have to want to come to work, and that's partly about compensation. It's partly about can they access childcare. It's partly about how long does it take to commute to work. There's a package that should be looked at of this hub level, and, and I um, would commend that to, to this committee and to the DOD for further um, investigation, the way it overlays with your existing activities and, and, and priorities ar around the country. The third issue, um, is, I think, um, worth stating out loud, which is China. And I, I think that that's uh, on, on the back of all our minds, or maybe the front, Senator Wicker, when we think about the potential threats here. And, and China is, of course, um, not just threatening, but actually investing very heavily in further research and development, trying to move innovation, trying to own the future of jobs uh, across a lot of um, civilian, but also, I think, military-related activities. And, and the best way to respond to that would be threefold. First of all, invest more in science for the United States. Secondly, figure out how to commercialize and bring more of those activities to market because if you've got a strong civilian economy supporting innovation, that's gonna help you on the military side also. And obviously there's, there's a huge amount of spillovers and, and interaction there. And again, I would recommend the hub-based approach for that. And the third approach, um, third piece would be to develop a, a, a line of work for artificial intelligence that is pro-worker. What do I mean by pro-worker? I mean, within the framework that Mr. Taylor's suggesting, AI is certainly arriving, but is this AI that is gonna displace manual workers and displace uh, workers with less education, or does it enhance their productivity and enhance their opportunities? I think it can actually go both ways. There's a lot of opportunity, a, a lot of issues around healthcare, a lot of issues around education, a lot of issues around manufacturing that are not the top priority for um, AI-oriented investments and innovation in the private sector. They're more, to, more about social media and digital advertising, to, to be frank. So focusing on those activities, and I think, um, I think both Senator Reid and Senator Wicker alluded to this, Changing how we think about manual work and thinking, changing the value we place on manual skills, I think that's something we've lost in this country over the past 40 or so years. It's something we were very strong at during World War II. That was the, the basis of being able to scale up that, that economy and, and move it towards wartime production. To the extent we've outsourced those jobs to other places and created fragile supply chains, we should look at AI as an opportunity to motivate people and to bring technology to bear that enhances the, the effectiveness of that part of the workforce. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. Dr. Lockwood, please. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, and fellow distinguished members of the Senate Armed Services Committee, good morning. Um, I'm honored to contribute to this timely discussion on trends impacting the nation's defense civilian workforce. Uh, my perspectives are informed by my own research, that of fellow economists, and also the work of many talented researchers uh, at the Institute for Defense Analyses and at other federally funded research and development centers supporting the Department of Defense. I should state that the views that I express today are mine and not necessarily those of IDA. 
as a nonpartisan institution. To succeed, the Department of Defense and its partners in the defense industrial base must maintain skilled, capable, and adequately staffed workforces. Today's labor market is characterized by the convergence of several important trends, some of which have been discussed today already, which together produce intense competition for talent, Increasing job market polarization, driven by technological advances, has left many mid-skill workers behind. Young men's rates of college attendance, enrollment, and completion are in decline. An aging workforce will bring waves of retirements to DOD, threatening continuity and also institutional memory. The gig economy, meanwhile, offers workers low commitment alternatives and a very flexible lifestyle. And remote work is here to stay in some form or other. In addition, affordable housing shortages add to existing downward pressure on worker mobility, and rapid advances in AI and other technologies are accelerating competition for STEM graduates. One or two of these concurrent trends alone would be troubling, but taken together, I believe they represent a sea change. At present, there is excess demand for labor in the United States, with 9.5 million open positions for only 6.5 million workers. And that's assuming every worker is well suited to the open positions, which they are not. DOD and its industry partners are not currently well positioned to compete effectively for the high demand talent that our national security requires. These trends impact each segment of the labor force that this committee seeks to address. Wage grade workers in our shipyards and our arsenals, STEM professionals in our labs and in the acquisition workforce, and critical supervisors and middle managers on the GS schedule. A common set of prescriptions can pr improve the health of each. To compete for the skilled workers that DOD and its partners in the industrial base need to accomplish their critical missions, the department should act aggressively to hire faster, pay competitively, reward performance, manage underperformance, and set the conditions needed for managers to make effective workforce mix decisions. Moreover, DOD has an excellent opportunity to engage with this missing middle of mid-skill workers, a labor segment traditionally heavily involved in national defense. By filling critical shortfalls with a combination of trained workers and enabling technologies, some of the AI that my colleagues here have spoken to already. People need purpose and inspiration to get off the couch and back in the workforce. If you take away only one idea from my time with you today, please let that be that incentives matter. By incentives, I do not only mean the pay and benefits that employees might earn for an excellent performance. I also mean the conditions under which DOD's many managers, workers, and researchers invest their personal effort and make day-to-day -day decisions that impact the department's bottom line. I believe that DOD's dedicated workers generally want to make optimal choices, but are often stymied in doing so. You can set the conditions to align incentives within these decision environments to make it easier for everyone to choose the sensible thing for the mission and for the taxpayer in their daily work, whether that is shaping DOD's workforce mix or when managing their teams. Incentive alignment will produce more effective decisions and free resources for other mission critical areas. I personally think we could use a few more submarines. Decisive action can help achieve this incentive alignment and will reinvigorate DOD's civilian workforce by clearly signaling that the department values its wage grade, professional, and defense industry personnel that it will recognize and reward their contributions. These innovations will allow DOD to advance as a high-performing organization. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you all for excellent testimony, uh, really superb. And this is, I think, a beginning of a, a dialogue, not uh, a one-stop uh, and, and move on. And I like submarines, but I, I share that with Senator Wicker. Uh, the only here, here, it, it, the only thing I take issue with is she said a few. We need you know, quite a lot more submarines. I agree. The only condition he puts on them, they all have to be named after a city in Mississippi. But that's a small point. Um, one of the issues that I see as I try to deal with these issues is that we have a problem bringing in um, uh, new workers. Uh, we also have a problem at the supervisory level. And our uh, discussions with uh, 
people in the industry say that's probably one of the key, key things that are slowing them down. Uh, they, they can get by with younger workers, but without the supervisors, they can't leverage those workers. So, Mr. Taylor and Dr. Johnson, Dr. Lockwood, your comments. Well, indeed, so I alluded to that. Thank you, Chairman Reed. We know that in, even in industries like the tech valley, in, in Silicon Valley, the tech industries, we can get the employees to come in. The difficulty is keeping those employees. And increasingly, the new difficulty is keeping people in middle management, in part because we've naively assumed that because one is a great mechanic, that one will be a great manager of mechanics. And so we take that person, we don't invest in teaching them how to be a great people manager, they hate the job and the employees that work for them hate the job and therefore no one wins and that has led to the retention problem. So one of the areas that we strongly recommend the Department of Defense consider doing is investing in people management. How do you, it's not enough for someone to have the technical, the underlying technical skills. We've got to teach them, you know, technically to do the job, but teach them how to manage people because Listen, at the end of the day, we've all talked about compensation, and compensation does matter, but all of the data tells us that people will leave an employer if the only thing they're doing is making a lot of money but being mistreated, and they don't find that this is a good work environment. So people management work is a lot of the work that the Department of Defense should consider investing in. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson, your comment. So, Senator Reid, I think there's a good news, bad news uh, aspect to artificial intelligence in answer to your question. The good news is, there is definitely potential, and we can see it already in some parts of the private sector, to develop tools that will enhance the ability of supervisors to manage more effectively and, and perhaps make it more easier to transition to become a supervisor. So th I don't think there's enough effort going into that. I think that would be something very good for the DOD to focus on also. But I think that the bad news part is there is also a tendency, and not I'm sure in this room, but elsewhere, to, to think about algorithms as, as replacing people and doing the work, and we can rely on them and we can close our eyes and the car will drive itself. That's a bad mistake. But what we're looking, what we're looking at, is, as, as Taylor already said, is different ways for people to interact with machines at the supervisory level. But I would emphasize making those manual jobs more attractive, more interesting, uh, pulling younger people in with an AI element, not thinking about replacing people, because that uh, will be a mistake. Dr. Lockwood, please. Uh, yes, I'll just build on both of these gentlemen's remarks uh, by noting I wholeheartedly support Mr. Taylor's cry for additional training. Uh, I'll note that among our defense workforce that our uniform personnel are frequently sent to special schools to learn managerial and leadership skills. However, very little investment is made in our civilian managers. Um, and this is, a, this is a critical gap that you can fill. I will note that some important changes have been made, some, some progress has been made in the area of leadership training uh, for, this, for the acquisition workforce in particular, but leadership is different than management. So this is, a, this is a key opportunity for the department. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of uh, addressing our problems, uh, one suggestion that I think everyone made, directly or indirectly, is we've got this pool of uh, workers, uh, in military personnel, that we can transition. And just very quickly, because my time is expiring rapidly, not already. Uh, Mr. Taylor, so how do we uh, encourage a military personnel who are leaving the service to go into industries related? Yes, we know that there currently exist transition programs, but uh, we've got to double down on those. If we know that an individual is within six months to 12 months away from either retiring or completing their military service, we've got to give them the skills to make sure that they can translate that either to a role in the DIB, maybe not necessarily in the military, or within the private sector. So training them on how to become recruitable in the private sector would be the way to do it. Thank you. I, 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 my time is fine. And there's one other question that I want to, or comment I want to put on the, the table. One is, uh, Dr. Locke was focused on the acquisition forces in DOD and management training. One of the areas, I think, too, is in the civilian companies, the contractors. I, my sense is they, they don't do that very well. Is uh, Dr. Lockwood your, or Dr. John? Um, I would respectfully take a question on the management within our contractual partners for the record. Very good. Thank you. Dr. John? I, I 
think you're pressing on exactly the right issue here, Senator Reid. I think that we're under-investing in managerial capabilities across a large part of our economy. And of course, there's a, there's a big um, sucking sound as talent gets pulled towards the Silicon Valley type of sector and the rest of the economy is neglected and un under-invested in by, by itself, which is very counterproductive from an economic point of view and from a national security point of view. So I, I think you're, ab this is absolutely top priority in line with both, with certainly what Mr. Taylor said, I'm sure, with what Ms. Lockwood will say later. Last word very quickly, Mr. Taylor. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Senator Worker, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In a 2023 Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, um, workers were asked uh, whether they agree with this statement. In my work unit, differences in performance are recognized in a meaningful way. Only 45% of uh, respondents agreed with that. The same survey asked uh, this question, um, asked if they agree with this statement. There are no poor performers in my work unit. Only 19% of employees said that. Um, Dr. Lockwood, in your written statement, you say DOD needs to accelerate reprimand or uh, separation in cases of underperformance that does not improve with reasonable training investment. Uh, tell us about that and what can Congress do? Thank you for the question. I think the bottom line is that if high performers are compensated, promoted, and otherwise treated the same as mediocre performers, that those high performers will be discouraged and take their talent somewhere else. Uh, so I think we can pretty clearly say that that's suboptimal for the department. Uh, I think there are a number of things the department could do to uh, enable managers. Um, one thing is perhaps to limit employment terms. So uh, one might imagine a new form of federal employment, uh, a limited term contract. We see this in several other developed economies. Uh, this would kind of split the difference perhaps between the use of a uh, very flexible contracted solution uh, through a, through a one of our industrial-based partners or our typical federal contractor, um, and the, what we understand now as federal employment uh, to give both the department and the worker added flexibility. Uh, uh, okay, that, so I, I asked what Congress could do, and uh, do you think it would take statutory uh, changes to implement something like that? I do, uh, in particular because oftentimes both civilian and uniformed managers have concern of, of reprisal or other forms of, of unfortunate action should they do the hard work of trying to separate uh, a, a non-productive member of a staff. So uh, Congress clearly signaling that this is your intent and desired outcome I believe would be helpful to the department. Let me uh, ask all of you about the federal wage system. Um, it's uh, not been reformed since 72. It's going to be a long time. Um, it has weaknesses such as the system and determining the, the wage is hyper-local. <clears throat> it's incredibly bureaucratic and complicated. And by law, public unions, public employee unions are heavily involved. Dr. Lockwood, let's start with you. Um, um, in, in my opening statement, I mentioned welders and electricians. The Navy's public shipyards are struggling to hire and retain these critical workers. Um, does the FWS have something to do with this, and what can Congress do to help? I believe it does. Um, so currently wages are set in pretty high bound grades where we're taking a number of perhaps currently unrelated occupations, binding them together and setting wages within a few steps for that grade. Those grades were established back in the 70s based on the prevailing wages of that time and currently been together occupations that don't resemble one another at all. I believe a far more effective approach would be to compensate on the occupational level uh, both with a view toward the local wage but also understanding that uh, should we need to draw workers into a labor market that's relatively undersupplied, it will take a higher wage to do so. We need to set wages cognizant of not only occupation locally, but also nationally. We're, we're um, it, it seems to me we're just going to basically um, 
have to give the, the department um, flexibility beyond specific instructions. I believe that's the case. Dr. Johnson and Mr. Taylor. I would just add, uh, <clears throat> Senator, there's a very big issue coming to you soon with regard to workplace surveillance because the tools for surveilling workers are already greatly enhanced. And in that conversation, there'll be, and I think this is something that OSHA will be looking to Congress for, for guidance on. Um, I, I think you have to consider uh, to what extent that surveillance makes workers safer, more productive, and lines up with reasonable in incentive systems, as Dr. Lockwood was saying, and to what extent it becomes oppressive and discourages workers from coming into work for the indus defense industrial base. This is going to be a very hot issue very quickly. And including that, Senator Wicker, in a, in a discussion of the federal wage system could be quite a, quite a good idea. I would also emphasize the need for more housing. So one reason wages have to be higher in some areas is because that community decided not to build housing. Uh, now, that's the decision of the community. It's not usually up to Congress. But I think uh, deciding to spend your submarine dollars in places where housing is affordable suggests to me you'll be able to build more submarines for the same wage bill. And I would add, from the private sector side, we use the term pay for performance. And if Congress can do anything to give the flexibility to the, uh, the government worker, the Department of Defense, you could actually help there. Ultimately, people, that doesn't surprise me, the 19% say only 19% they have they no poor performers. The government has for, for quite a while recruited people and what part of the sell has been job security. Well, that's the downside. If you know that you have job security, then there's no incentive necessarily to do anything to not have your job. But more importantly, why would you differentiate if there is no pay for performance? If I'm going to make give or take 1% more than the colleague who does barely enough to get past, then there is no incentive for people to work harder and for you to attract the best talent. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to our witnesses. A couple of uh, topics I want to get into. First, uh, Mr. Taylor, I appreciate that the Society for Human Resource Managers has supported a bill that I have been promoting for many years. Uh, I talk about it a lot in the Help Committee, and they're tired of me talking about it, but I don't talk about it a lot at Armed Services, the JOBS Act. We do not allow Pell Grants to be used for high-quality career and technical education. It's got to be a college. Um, and an awful lot of really high quality job training programs are not college semester in length instead of a 15 week course that you meet three times a week for an hour and a half. A lot of high quality job training is an eight week course where you're five days a week, eight hours a day, many more classroom hours than a semester. We allow Pell Grants to be used for full time students, for part time students, uh, for, for people who are incarcerated if they're getting college credits that they can use to get employed when they're in, back in society but we've never allowed Pell Grants to be used for high quality career and tech. Um, I think if we could pass the JOBS Act, and it's wide, wildly bipartisan, I think I've got about 65 of my colleagues who are sponsoring it, particularly at a moment when we've just done a big infrastructure bill, who's gonna build it? We've just done a big manufacturing bill, who's gonna make it? We've just made a commitment to build subs with the Australians, but both the US and Australia have some similar workforce challenges. So I, I am very much appreciate uh, uh, SHRM supporting the Jobs Act, and I would look forward to working with my colleagues to figure out some way to finally get movement on it at a time when the unemployment rate is low. To another topic that I'd like to ask your opinion on, um, there's a wonderful program that I've been involved with called the Accelerated Training for Defense Manufacturing Program that is done in Danville, Virginia at the Institute for Advanced Learning and Research, and it's investment to build the submarine industrial base. And in that program, we bring people from all over the United States who are working with suppliers in the industrial base, some of the main shipyards, but also some suppliers. They train side by side. There's Aussies there now, part of the AUKUS arrangement. But also I noticed the last time I went, there's a lot of Afghans. Afghans who served patriotically with the United States in Afghanistan, they've moved to the United States and they're like, I'll, I'll be a shipbuilder. Strikes me that one of the answers to this uh, issue on workforce shortages is immigration. An immigration reform system that prioritizes workforce is something that's really important. Oftentimes when we talk about immigration here, it's all about the border. And we ought to talk about the border, but we also need to talk about the workforce. An unemployment rate that's as low as ours right now, um, there's not gonna be a solution to some of these problems that does not involve a work-based immigration reform. And I was hoping that you might just each offer your perspectives on that. Well, 
Senator Ken, you, you mentioned something that is at the core of most of the conversations in human resource circles. The fact of the matter, a matter is that Americans have been having fewer and fewer children over the last two decades. So we have a birth rate problem. We have a replenishment, a replenishment problem. And so we at Sherm are very careful not to get into the political issues of immigration other than to say we need these eight or nine or 10 million jobs to be filled. And it would it is just nonsensical that we would, in many instances, have people who we've allowed to come to the US, we've educated them in our schools, and then we send them back when we have open jobs for them to fill. So again, staying away from the political parts of it, the reality is employers are saying we need this talent. This is We don't have the luxury of saying, great, we're going to have a bias against people who are not born trained here in the U.S. In fact, we need all the talent. So Sherman is quite supportive of this immigration. Now, how we get to that is a different issue. We need to ensure that we protect our border and our homeland, and we need to know who is in our country is our opinion. At that point, getting them to the talent, matching them up with organizations is something that we all are pushing for and frankly demanding at this point with 3.7% unemployment. Dr. Johnson and Lockwood. So, Senator Kane, I see your two proposals as, as very tightly connected. My understanding is that the current Pell Grant system had its origins in the 1958 National Defense Education Act, mm -hmm. which is itself a response to Sputnik and, and a realization by Congress that we needed more engineers and scientists. So there was a big push at the higher end of education for math and science, but not so much for in this, in this middle, mid, the middle skill area that, that we're talking about. So that's a, bit, but that's a gap we've, we've had for a long time. And, and I, you're abs I, I think your idea is absolutely brilliant and, and spot on. But then when it comes to immigration, I think the question is, are we providing sufficient opportunities to all the people born in the United States, including in that middle area? And if we are, and, and they're not taking them, or if we still have gaps, then I think the, the case for mm -hmm. immigration on, on a work-based um, or a skills basis, immigration reform is very compelling. MIT, I, I'm an immigrant senator, as you may have guessed, and I went to, I have a PhD from MIT, and there's many other people in MIT currently who would love to spend their careers building the economy and strengthening the national security of the, of the United States. And many of them will be able to come in because we have, not easy, but various points of entry if you have a master's degree or higher into the United States. But we don't do that for skilled labor because in part of the insecurity and concerns about opportunities for native-born Americans in that part of the labor force. But I think both your ideas together, Senator, I would make a package because I think that is a compelling um, joint and twofold attack on the same problem. Thank you. Dr. Lockwood, I'm over time, but you could be as succinct as Mr. Taylor was earlier um, at, when he closed over time. Yes, uh, we absolutely need to invest in uh, skills-based education, and we need to, to stop enshrining the four-year degree as the only valuable and worthwhile thing that a young person can do. We've over-invested in bachelor's degree education and under-invested in, in core skills training. So that's something Congress can do now. Um, I'll just also note that uh, our our Immigrant base is wildly productive in terms of new business starts and general entrepreneurship, and skills-based immigration is definitely something that has been an incredible net benefit to the American economy, and it ought to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kane. Senator Tuberville, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd also like to add on to Senator Kane's uh, thoughts on uh, you know Pell Grants government grants, loans. Uh, I spent 40 years in education business. It's out of control. We need to use it for the right reasons. It needs to be redrawn. I've seen people take Pell Grants, go buy cars with them, drop out of school immediately after they got their Pell Grants. I've seen the same thing with loans. Uh, there's not enough oversight on it. But we need to put more emphasis on what we're doing and in in, in what he's calling the Jobs Act. And we get more out of it if we would just concentrate on it and put some authority behind it and let people know that you've got to do it the right way. And I'm all for uh, jobs training because I've seen a lot of these kids that go to four-year universities and waste their time and get degrees that they can't get jobs when they get out. Their job has got to be at Walmart or somewhere else like that. And it's not that Walmart's a bad job. It's just you, if you spend four years of your money or the government's money and going to school, you need to have some kind of opportunity to achieve something uh, more successful. You know, I come from Alabama and we have a industrial base of um, about 50 billion annually, 300,000 jobs that work in our in, uh, military industrial base. We have Alabama shipyard in Austell, USA. We build ships, submarines, you name it. Uh, 
it, it's it's an amazing place. I enjoy going into these buildings and watching these people work. What's amazing to me, the stories I get are, are from some of these major corporations is not, they take their own initiative. They're going to fast food places and recruiting and watching people work. And one uh, shipbuilder told me that their best welders have come from fast food joints because they're willing to work. Dr. Locke would be careful. You tell them people get up off the couch and go to work. You don't need to say that around here, uh, but they do. We have got to get people back to work. So, Dr. Johnson, you, you brought up a few minutes ago that we've, our workforce has dropped since World War II. Well, we all know that. I mean, that's a problem. What's the cause and what's the solution to that? I mean, we got to have, the, what's the cause first? We all know we have to have the cause of that since World War II and the solution. Is it NAFTA that we sent our manufacturing overseas? Because China has five to one manufacturing plants compared to us here in the United States. Uh, is that part of it? Well, uh, Senator, when I think of Alabama, I think of Huntsville and the remarkable success there of the rocket program, which was basically built from scratch in, in a place that had tremendous, um, no doubt, potential, but had not previously established itself in that area of technology. And we used to do that a lot, Senator. That was a big lesson uh, out, of, out of World War II. We used to do it all around the country, and the private sector did it as well as the public sector. But unfortunately, what's happened due to market forces, and so I'm not blaming any particular individual, is we've shifted much more of that innovative activity towards the East Coast and the West Coast. These are cities that don't like to build more housing. Price of housing is very high. It's hard to move there. A lot of the expertise in, in, the, in the middle, the middle skills part of manufacturing, for example, in the Midwest of the United States, um, is stranded there because the opportunities are other places, but they can't afford to move because of the, the housing market, and we're not making a best use of our talent. So I think more investments in more communities, including Alabama, which is features very highly in our book, by the way, that's the right geographic approach in general to bolstering science and technology. And when it comes to national defense, uh, Senator, I think it lines up even, even better because you want to build, we want to build communities with these skills. People don't move that much, great. So those, those skills will stay in this community that's focused on producing submarines. Or, or, or rockets or whatever that community is, that that's going to be a very strong local regional defense base. So we'll use a little bit of our uh, disadvantages in our favor in, in this case, and, and I think we'll get a better economy and, and more national security as, as a result. Yeah, and I think still in our country, we still have a lot of patriotism out there. Sometimes we don't see that, but people want to work for our military industry, and, uh, and they, make, they make very good money. I mean, but you've got to pay a price. You've got to sacrifice, and we can't, we can't, overlook our education in this country. Our education is going south. Take it from somebody that's been in high schools all over this country is my former job. Uh, the things that we're teaching are not in conducive to, to, to push these young men and women in making better for themselves. I mean, they just say, if I get a degree or if I get a diploma in high school, that's good enough. And that's really not good enough. They've got to be incentivized on how to do it. And I, Mr. Taylor was talking earlier about that. You know, we got to incentivize. But again, it all goes back to our military industry. Uh, as you said, Huntsville, uh, it is growing. I just bought a new house up there. I watched it go up, okay? There wasn't, in the entire time that that house was built, there wasn't one white American, one black American, or one Asian American that worked on that house. It was people from other countries, okay? I don't know whether they were legal or not. They said they were, and I asked them, I said, make sure there's not, I, I happen to be a senator, make sure there's people that are Americans that are working on this house, but we can't build anything. We can't build anything unless we have immigration in this country. I truly believe that. I truly believe that, but we gotta do it the right way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Tuberville. Uh, Senator Rosen, please. Uh, well, thank you, Chairman Reed, uh, for holding this hearing. I'd like also like to thank each of the witnesses, of course, for testifying uh, today. And uh, I worked my former career in STEM, and so I want to talk a little bit about the STEM workforce shortage. And as mentioned in the National Defense Stra Industrial Strategy, we have to find creative solutions to upskill our manufacturing workforce so that we can meet our nation's strategic production uh, targets and our goals. And so, Mr. Taylor, can you? speak to the labor shortages in STEM fields, the impact in our defense industrial base, and if there are specific sectors uh, impacted by the skilled workforce sh shortage um, more than others. Right, as you can imagine, thank you, Senator Rosen. You know, one of the problems is we, we wait too long to talk about what the talent 
problem is. We say, we look to employers and say, you've not hired enough engineers this year, for example. The reality is this is a PK through 12 problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we are not looking at it. We want to solve for it immediately. We have a pipelining problem from the diversity, for example, of the types of Americans who come through the systems, K through 12 educations, we know disproportionately underperform in communities, uh, underrepresented minorities, and then you wake up and say, well, we don't have enough diverse talent in STEM. Well, it's because that started 13, 14 years ago. It didn't start immediately. And so employers are committed to the idea of increasing and solving for their STEM worker talent sh shortages, but we know when we say it, SHRM, it's the two E's. It's education and employers. We've got to start a lot earlier in the process. Uh, the other thing that the senator just spoke to is that increasingly companies are going straight to high schools and saying, in fact, some new instances of going to middle schools and saying, I'm going to identify your kids now, ensure that they are obtaining the skills that we need to, the STEM skills, you know, the basic maths, the sciences, et cetera. And we essentially are going to pull them through and mentor them so that we have potentially employable people 10, 12 years later, as opposed to hoping that the K through 12 system will provide the pipeline. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because my very first bill was called Building Blocks of STEM, and it does exactly that and allows to build that STEM pipeline, K through 12, uh, schools all across America to invest in STEM education. And uh, I've seen the greatest programs in kindergarten and elementary school. Uh, they kind of use little robotics and uh, fun things. The kids don't even realize they're learning STEM, but they're learning all of these uh, great things of logic, so thank you for bringing that up, and I was glad to have a bill passed to do that. Uh, but I'm gonna move on to Dr. Johnson. As DOD, we're gonna focus on partnering with the private sector. We know that's really important to increase our workforce prepared in that, uh, preparedness. Um, how can the department expand its outreach to encourage more of the private sector um, in the advanced manufacturing process? Well, I think that, that's, a, that's a great question, Senator. And I think focusing on hubs, areas, geographies, where the private sector has the potential, where you can, you have the labor force, you have the potential labor force, including with your, with your um, admirable STEM initiative, and, and thinking about where housing can also be built, Senator Rosen. I think too often there's great opportunities in places where the communities don't want to build housing, so the housing just becomes super expensive. Then you either have to pay a very high wage or nobody's going to move there. So I, I think looking for those geographic partnerships is something that has not previously been sufficiently emphasized, Senator. Well, this isn't for defense, but we're becoming a new tech hub in Reno, and uh, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about happening um, in Nevada. But I'm gonna move on to Dr. Lockwood quickly because I wanna talk about the impact of budget delays. Uh, I know uh, the impact, failure to pass a full year funding deal, including for the DOD, it constrains our long-term strategic plans. Um, it has negative impacts for all of our prime contractors, for our subcontractors. They can't prepare and plan, and when you can't plan, you can't have the workforce. And if you lose the talent workforce and they go somewhere else for a job, they may not come back, and it takes a long time to build a qualified welder for a submarine and, and all of those kinds of things. So if we're gonna build those resilient supply chains for our defense industrial base, Congress must pass regular appropriations in a timely manner. So Dr. Lockwood, can you talk to us about the federal, the impact of the federal funding, the uncertainty all across our defense industrial base, what that really means for our safety and security across the the world. Absolutely. Um, I do view uncertainty in, in the timing of federal budgets to have a very negative impact on our total readiness posture. Uh, in addition, um, I would say that further dampens interest in federal employment uh, by creating the perception of, of turmoil and an unnecessary politicalization of these critical roles that we need filled. Um, I'll also add that particularly for young people who are just entering their careers, extremely long delays in time to hire often become untenable. Uh, they have loans looming, they need to start work immediately, they can't afford to wait six, 12 months That's to right. be certain of having a job. So this is something that we can address. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Senator Rosen, Senator Sullivan. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the witnesses today and a really, really important topic. By the way, I agree 100% with Senator Kane on his Jobs Act. I think it's something, and Senator Tuberville on what we need to do, but I think it's a really good opportunity and um, we should keep moving forward on that. 
As you know, when we're looking at our strategic competition, one of the things that the uh, dictators in Beijing, Xi Jinping and others are really scared about is our submarine force. It's an asymmetric advantage that is still very significant and uh, they're terrified by it, which is why we should be building a lot more submarines. Um, I met with the CNO of the Navy yesterday and just talked about how there's so much bipartisan interest here in the Congress to um, increase our capacity to build ships and subs. Uh, my, my staff had done some research for me. We have the capacity, we've done it before. Um, a lot of people don't know our country had a two year head start before Pearl Harbor on increasing our ship capacity. So in 19, uh, 1937, we had 335 ships in our fleet. By Pearl Harbor, uh, 19, December 7th, 1941, we had 790. Okay, so we doubled the size of the fleet before we got into a war. And it's a dangerous time right now, very analogous to the 1930s in my view. And a lot of what happened was Congress acted for laws in particular, the Vision Trammell Act, the Second Vision Trammell Act, the Naval Expansion Act of 1940, and the Two Ocean Navy Act of 1940. Um, so I wanna start with you, Dr. Lockwood. What are the big ideas, big ideas? We've done this before, right? We don't want to start building our industrial base out once the bullets start flying. The time to do it is now. And we've done this before. We have the capacity to do it as a nation before. Um, what are the big ideas that you think we need, particularly as it relates to subs? The estimates are we need over 100,000 new trained workers. Um, but I think the bipartisan nature of what is needed we would be open to anything, even a new shipyard. What are the big ideas? Uh, I wanna hear from you very briefly, and then uh, the others, if you can actually a respond in a request for the record. And then Dr. Johnson, I have a quick question for you on, on what's happening in Silicon Valley. But Dr. Lockwood, the biggest thought pieces you can do here. Thank you. Quickly. Let me quickly say that the submarine force is near and dear to my heart as the wife of a currently serving commander of a fast attack boat forward deployed in Guam, the USS right. Asheville. Um, well, Xi Jinping is scared to death of what your husband has to Indeed, bear. I, I believe that to be and a we true need fact, a lot, sir. We need a lot more of them. Yes, um, I do believe uh, the analysis I've seen has indicated there's simply no way that this country can meet its own needs and also support its AUKUS commitments without an additional shipyard. So Our you capacity. agree with the idea of additional shipyard? I do. A public shipyard? I think we need all available options, sir. Okay. I would be open to performing additional analysis to try and determine exactly what format would be most effective. Uh, but I'll note that in World War II, tanks rolled off the floor of the Ford plant. Yeah. And they're, they're damn proud of it, and they should be. Good, well, if you can get back to us with more details on that idea and other big think ideas on this, the way the Congress acted prior to World War II. Very impressive. Um, Dr. Johnson, real quick, I agree with Senator Tuberville that there's still very much patriotism in our country that wants to help. One of the ironic areas that I've kept a close eye on over the last several years is the return of patriotism in Silicon Valley. 10 years ago, they didn't have it, right? You know, they were, they were much more interested in working with the goddamn Chinese communists than um, American military industrial capabilities. That's changing. It's a great opportunity for us as a country. It's a strategic advantage that Chinese and Russians don't have. But the Pentagon's culture and rules don't allow, it to, don't allow us to take advantage of it. You've heard this phrase, the valley of death, right? You have a... High-tech companies got great capacity, can't break into the Pentagon system, and then the com company goes out of business 
because it takes five years to get the Pentagon interested. What is your thoughts on what we can do to enhance the ability of our industrial capacity to take advantage of this new interest with some of our high-tech companies who want to help us, want to help America be strong and not fund the Chinese like so many of them used to do, which was very pathetic and un-American in my view. Yes, sir, I, I, I think you're, you're spot on with that overall characterization. I think you need some carrots. It's, it could be prizes, it could be prestige, it, things that pull those tech companies towards the problems that you want them to solve. Because if you leave them to their own devices, we know what they're going to do. It's more social media, it's more digital ads. I don't think that particularly helps national, national defense at all. So I, I think defining, using DARPA, type approach and define this is the problem to be solved, which could be a direct military problem or it could be healthcare related to the military. It could be transitioning uh, military personnel to civilian. It could be um, education more, more broadly. There's a lot of really important goals that matter a lot to you on this committee and, and Silicon Valley pays zero or almost zero attention to them. I, I will also, by the way, Senator, send you some enhanced, uh, some, some uh, reinforced reinforcement for your talking points on the role of submarines in World War II, the role of um, US innovation on naval aircraft prior to World War II, which was absolutely huge, and the fact that this country was producing roughly one aircraft carrier per month at its peak in World War II because we were able to move so much of our production in, when it was needed, but not prematurely. So you're right about the base that was built. Anyway, Senator, I'll follow up with you directly on that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, Senator Warren, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing on workforce dynamics. You know, the strong economic recovery under President Biden is a win for the United States. We have 14.8 million jobs created, fastest growth in real inflation-adjusted wages of any recovery in more than half a century. But there is still work to do. We need to invest in our defense manufacturing workforce and make sure that we have the workers that are needed to meet our national security needs. One tool that I'd like us to talk about for making sure that the labor supply keeps up with the labor demand is providing the quality, affordable childcare that workers need so they can actually go to work. You know, we do this to some degree already, including with the DOD's excellent childcare program. But while we could invest a whole lot more for our military and our civilian families, over half of Americans right now live in childcare deserts. That means children outnumber the childcare slots by three to one. And that means millions of families across the country that need childcare and either can't find it or if they can find it, they can't afford it. Professor Johnson, uh, you're an economist at MIT, former chief uh, economist at the IMF. So let's do some Econ 101 and drill down on the root of this problem. How does insufficient supply of childcare affect labor supply, including the defense workforce? The lack of adequate childcare obviously limits the ability of women to participate uh, in the workforce. And of course, many of those aircraft carriers and submarines that were built in World War II were built by women. Yeah. So not enough childcare means not enough workers to power our economy in the defense industry and basically everywhere else. But let's go down one more level on this. Professor Johnson, help us understand the bottleneck in childcare. If we want to increase the supply of childcare, what's the key input that we need more of? You need more people willing to work in the child care provision okay. sector. Okay, so we need more child care workers to help unlock this labor supply across the board. How can we do that? Why don't we just pay child care workers more money? Well, that is the best idea. I think that is what would work. But just to emphasize, these child care centers, for the most part, operate on razor-thin margins. So there's not much else to, to squeeze. And the, the money that's paid by parents goes to the child care workers, but the parents can't afford to pay the child care workers enough to pull, pull people into that child care work. So the market, I'm afraid, Senator Warren, is failing us here. Okay, so the market fails, but DOD has stepped up. DOD child development centers cap fees at 7% of family income, and then the federal government picks up the rest of the cost. It is a worthwhile investment in military readiness. But DOD has not updated its pay scale for childcare workers for 30 years now, 
And unsurprisingly, DOD is struggling to attract the workers it needs. Meanwhile, federal investments in civilian childcare fell off a cliff last year when the pandemic funding ended, and that exacerbated child care shortages. So Professor Johnson, if the federal government stepped up its investments in child care, particularly to increase child care worker pay, what impact would that have on the defense workforce? I think it would strengthen the defense workforce. More women would be able to go to work. You'd also have more opportunity for women to build the skills that we've all been talking about, we're emphasizing across all range of skills earlier in their careers. So instead of having to take some years out of the labor force, they would continue to be engaged. And that's really important for having supervisory talent, for example, when you, when you reach a certain age. And I take it, Mr. Taylor, do you agree with this? Not only do I agree, it's an area issue that uh, you're increasingly seeing on the private sector side. Corporations are underwriting, and, and we don't have a 50-year-old lag in terms of compensation. So many uh, increasingly organizations are building their own child care facilities and fully subsidizing them to draw talent in and to retain that talent. The other thing, though, Senator Warner, that Warren, that I think is really important is increasingly we speak about, and we're seeing this in all of our data, it's dependent care. So more than just child care, many of us find ourselves in the middle of this sandwich generation where you have to decide not to go take a job because no one is there to provide for your elderly parents or grandparents. So we are seeing a big theme in all of our data that says not only child care, but broadly dependent care. So I think this is terrific. You know, I'm all for building a strong defense manufacturing workforce, the topic we're here today to discuss. But let's treat it like the supply chain issue that it is and address root causes like underinvestment in child care and dependent care and child care workers. I'm glad to be working with members of this committee to invest in the DOD's child care program. I want to call out my uh, partner in this, Senator Scott. We're working on this in our subcommittee. And we're going to keep fighting for affordable child care for our defense workforce and for all Americans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. Senator Scott, please. I want to thank Senator Warren. We, we've had a good subcommittee on personnel. We're, we're having one this afternoon. It's going to talk about um, injuries from, um, <clears throat> I guess, more noise. Yeah. So it's going to be, it, it'll be interesting because we've got to, we've got to deal with this. So he, here's what I don't understand. You know how many full-time jobs have been added in the country in the last nine months, or last three months? Anybody know? We've lost 1.5 million. We're adding part-time jobs. So you're trying to figure out why is this happening? When I was, um, I became governor at the, um, at the end of a, a big downturn. I became governor in January 2011. And I, I went to a National Guard. Uh, they were coming back from overseas, and they had 30% unemployment. And then you know, I ran my whole campaign on getting people jobs. Uh, I said I'd get 700,000 jobs. And so I tried to figure out how to get that done. So we just tried to figure out. I had to go recruit companies every day to try to get them to come to Florida because people were moving out of Florida back in 2010 when I got elected. So we did a variety of things. Uh, first off, we, you know, we, as the federal government, we give a lot of money to our states to, um, for workforce boards. And do you know how many people they were filling jobs for? Nobody had any idea. There was no measurement. So the first thing is we required them to give us a daily report. It was over, I think it was 250, over $250 million a year that we were spending off federal money. That's number one. Number two is we, I'm, I'm a veteran, and I think it's, it's ridiculous that people come back from overseas and don't have a job. I remember I, w I was getting out at the, uh, right after, I, I was, I didn't go to Vietnam, but I served during Viet the Vietnam era, and when Vietnam ended, it was impossible to get a job in this country. And so all my friends here now couldn't find a job. Um, so, so we started ranking, we started uh, getting monthly reports on that, and it took about a year. We did a variety of programs, we did a lot of workforce uh, meetings and things like that. It took about a year, but actually our unemployment went, was lower for our veterans than it was for non-veterans. It was way higher for veterans when I started. I think it was almost 15% or something like that when I started. Unemployment for the state was over 10. And then what we started doing is we, when I became governor, all they wanted to do is say, oh, if you don't go to college, you know, man, you know, you must, you know, must not be very smart. You're not going to have any opportunity, which is complete BS. 
Um, most of my family didn't go to college. I'm, I'm the exception of my brothers and sisters, my nieces and nephews, and they're never unemployed. They always have a job. The other thing we did is we waived a whole bunch of things for our veterans. Um, so let me, here's my first question. Um, so we have all these rules for, um, uh, for, for schools, and we have state schools, we have, we have not-for-profits, we have uh, for-profits, we have all this stuff. Should there be different standards for everybody? I mean, when you, when you guys hire somebody, you say, man, I think they ought to, there ought to be a different standard for how they get federal money or Pell Grants or any of this stuff. Should they be, should be treated differently just because of their, uh, how they're organized? Does anybody have a view on that? Because, I mean, I'll give, give, give you an example. If you're a university, you have no obligation to help people get a job. Now, I changed the formula in Florida, and we became number one higher education because I said, I remember I'm a kid that had no money, went to school, went to junior college because it was only 200 bucks a semester. The university was expensive, 255. And I said, we're going to we're gonna give our universities money based on three things. Do you get a job? How much money do you make? What's it cost to get a degree? So actually, people got degrees, and we kept tuition low. So by the time I left, we were number one higher education. Now University of Florida, uh, according to a lot of studies like Wall Street Journal, uh, is the number one public university in the country because we paid for our result. So what do you guys think about having, having the same standards for, if we have standards for proprietary schools that they have to help people get a job or they don't get money, same standards for uh, all schools? So, Senator, I work for an engineering school that spends a lot of time trying to get its graduates uh, jobs, and I fully agree that's a very important emphasis. I also point to Orlando. It's uh, emphasized in our book as one of the leading examples of public-private partnerships generating skills related to the defense industrial base and also generating a huge amount of, of jobs. Um, do I think that one size we, we should have one size fits all for even higher education, even the university sector. I think some diversity and competition is good. I think MIT does very well in, in that competition. I think encouraging others to do exactly what you're saying is a good idea. Would, would I require it? I, I think in this country, it, such requirements are hard to, hard to make work and, and often get a backlash. But I think where, you, where you're pushing, Senator, that education of all kinds should be linked to finding jobs and keeping people in jobs and measuring outcomes and making that data available to everyone, I think that's tremendously important, Senator. Senator. Can I ask one question real quick? So the other thing I did was, if you came down, if you were, if you were her Harris and you were going to expand, or let's say Northrop Grumman, they said they're going to add, they were, they were moving the stealth bomber, so I tried to get them to do more of it in Florida. So I, they said, we're going to need X number of jobs. So we guaranteed it. I guaranteed, because I paid for it out of the state budget, I said, we're going to graduate these peoples in the, with these degrees. And some of them were universities, some of them were technical schools and stuff like that. So do you think that that's what we ought to be doing with our education dollars? I, I think workforce planning, uh, Senator, of exactly the kind you're talking about is, is, is very good. I, I think we need to be careful about over-subsidizing the private sector for things they would otherwise have done. But if it's a net increase to the defense industrial base and on a federal state uh, partnership basis, I absolutely agree that making sure people have the skills and, and, and are incentivized to stay in Florida, which, which, which is also what has obviously happened. I think that's really important for the development of the defense industrial base. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Scott. Uh, Senator Hirono, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We know that uh, there is a workforce shortage in just about every business, every industry, from restaurants to the defense industry. For, this is for Mr. Taylor. The DOD has established the Defense Civilian Training Corps to attract top talent into the defense ecosystem and uh, specifically re relating to acquisitions. So how is this training corps doing in terms of attracting the kind of people that the defense industry needs? Thank you for the question. I think Dr. Locke would be more familiar with that particular DTC program. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll note that there are actually currently several uh, STEM employment uh, workforce coordination programs going on in the Department of Defense, uh, and certainly that one's among them. Um, I believe that these programs would, would be far more effective if there was a greater, a greater degree of coordination among them uh, for example, sharing of hiring objectives and uh, even even of, of candidates. Uh, likewise, to the to the other senator's point earlier, um, providing metrics for such programs uh, would be would be very important. Well, why isn't there coordination? Why aren't there metrics to measure the effectiveness of these programs? Whose responsibility is it to ensure those aspects are addressed? Thank you for the question. Uh, as to the 
particular statutory authority. I'll, I'll take that for the record. Um, I, I will note that uh, a, a, a mandate to coordinate among programs to share best practices, uh, to uh, ensure that these programs are appropriately targeted to market and are, are adequately innovating uh, would, would be very effective. And I believe that's something that the Congress and the Senate in particular can draw greater attention to. Okay, you can help us, uh, my staff, to uh, uh, b better focus on some of those kinds of changes if we need to change. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I was particularly gratified that you mentioned that if we want people to have STEM uh, experiences in education, that it's it's really uh, something that we should look at from pre-K to 12, and that uh, uh, we also should pay attention to diversity. So yes, uh, Senator Rosen has a bill that would encourage, I think, more um, emphasis on these kinds of programs. I have a bill that would focus on women and minorities in STEM education. What, what ideas do you have uh, that would uh, focus us on the need for uh, paying attention to K-12 and onward if we want more people to, to um, be STEM educated? So uh, thank you for that question. I had the good fortune of once running what was called the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, which represents the country's publicly supported historically black colleges and universities, 47 of them. In fact, Mr. Gates here was my colleague. We specifically created a program where we went into three markets that were largely populated with uh, historically underrepresented people. And we took kids who were between the ages of, and I want to get the numbers right, nine and 13 with a specific focus on taking those kids in after school programs that were STEM oriented to expose those children and their families and, and to STEM careers, but more importantly, the importance of taking certain types of curriculum early on so that by the time, if you wanted to go to college to be an engineer, there are things you needed to do in high school, courses you had to take, et cetera. So we mapped them, we gave them, oftentimes their families did not have, they didn't have parents who were college graduates, or if they were college graduates, they weren't STEM college graduates. We literally took those kids and we followed them through 10th grade, preparing them up to and including taking the SAT, ACT, et cetera. So those sorts of programs helped us yield a significantly higher number of future STEM workers from those communities than would have without them. So you're saying that we have to be very intentional yes. about how we're going about it and that you have some longitudinal data that shows that when you are this focused, that you will have people going into the STEM areas because, for example, women and minority people drop out of the, the STEM uh, pipeline at every step of the way because, especially for women, for example, there are not very many models for women in STEM. And in, in terms of workforce training, uh, we are building a dry dock at Pearl Harbor Shipyard. It is the biggest infrastructure project that the DOD is engaged in. It is uh, $3.5 I, I hope that it will come in at that <laughs> price. But they had a hard time finding workers for this project. Some 2,000 plus workers will be needed to build this dry dock over the next two years or so. Um, and in the meantime, we have an apprenticeship program for the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard, one of four public uh, shipyards that we have. They had 2,500 applicants for 152 positions. So obviously there are a lot of people who want to get this kind of training so they can be in the pipeline to work in our shipyards, but we're not creating enough spaces for them. Do any of you have any ideas what we can do to accommodate these young people who want to be trained in our workforce. Anyone? Yes. <clears throat> um, it's already been mentioned by a few of my colleagues here, but uh, school to work training pipelines and close public-private partnerships with educational institutions uh, are, are very effective at establishing firm pipelines for workers. We've demonstrated this many times in the private sector, particularly in the auto industry. Uh, in some of the states represented here, um, reinforcing the training at community colleges and trade schools and linking those, those skilled professions directly into where the jobs are needed. 
Senator, apprenticeships powered by AI. I think that's where the future is, and that's what the private sector is not going to do enough without your prompting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Runoff. Senator Mullen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the witnesses that are here. I, I just find it the irony of us talking about what we need to do to get a workforce going, and you know, from a, a guy that's on multiple uh, trade companies. Um, I mean, we incentivize in Congress, we incentivize people to stay home. They can work the system. I mean, here we're legalizing, we're legalizing drugs, marijuana for medical purposes, and we're incentivizing kids to get a medical card to smoke marijuana in high school at 18 years old, and they can't pass a drug test to get hired by DOD to begin with. I mean, we do it to ourselves here in Congress. If we want to really get our workforce going, then we need to incentivize people to work, not have an excuse to stay home. Uh, and, and we have a program that gives the people a helping hand, but we won't give them a helping hand to push them into the workforce either. We'd like to get a helping hand, you stay on a platform, and then you disincentivize them to be able to step up. I've had hundreds of employees that refuse a raise over the years that I have been self-employed because they can't afford to take the raise because if they take this raise to $18 an hour, they lose these uh, benefits. And if you can't take a raise to $18 an hour and do that job, you're never gonna be able to get the job that can do $30 an hour because the ladder stops at that point. It's our fault. And so if we in Congress wanna get serious about the workforce, then we need to figure out how we incentivize people to get into the workforce. That means we need to push them into the workforce, not become, not allow them to become dependents of the state. And that's exactly what we have. We have three generations now of people that are dependent on the state. But that's me ranting. I'll stop. And I will, I will, I will move on to actually my questions. Uh, Dr. Larkwood, uh, I would like to, like to start with you. As the largest maintenance repair and overhaul facility in the world, which is at Tinker Air Force Base, uh, we have a huge number of civilian employer, employees around 16,000. Most of these employees are wage grade main, uh, uh, maintainers and many have decades of experience. We have received reports from, uh, or reports that the DLA, which is the Defense Logistic Agency, uh, is increasingly relying on contractors to do these kinds of jobs at other sites. Are you familiar with this? Yes. Okay, uh, with a follow-up question on that then, uh, when using contractors instead of government employees, what are the vetting requirements for bringing, uh, for bringing them in on our basis? It's my understanding that like other workers um, on, on military facilities that they must pass a, a background investigation. Are, are, are we concerned um, about moving that direction with contract? instead of having actual our own contractors or our own employees working for the Department of Defense in the civilian capacity, relying I, more on that? I will note that uh, the use of contractors in general is very costly to the department. In many cases, the department is paying a heavy premium right. for the use of contractors. So uh, rather than necessarily take the expedient route of simply contracting out for that additional labor support, I would encourage instead the department to correctly align incentives for the management of its own civilian personnel. It, is it, is it, I mean, because we are paying a much higher price to have outside contractors. Um, and, and so if we can pay that wage for outside contractors, what is it that's keeping the, our government, us, from upping the wages of individuals? Because we have, we have uh, we're literally losing employee contractors and tinker because they're getting picked off by outside industries that's give them a, a $10,000 sign-on bonus, and then we're turning back around and hiring them as contractors to come back in and work on the base for an exuberant amount more. You are it, absolutely correct. So what, what do we need to do to change that here in Congress? Right. Um, I'll note that uh, currently the, the Department of Defense does not have the salary flexibilities that it needs in order to pay workers a going wage. It is bound to the federal wage schedule, uh, which has been superseded several times by statute, creating great distortions in that wage that's actually offered to workers on the ground. Uh, furthermore, the, the structures that surround civilian hiring are cumbersome, uh, and it's very difficult for uh, 
um, civilian employees of the department, civilian managers to actually manage that workforce effectively, uh, dealing, dealing with um, Contractors is far simpler. If you need to dismiss someone for underperformance, you can do that immediately. You don't need to justify it. You don't need to go through a year's worth of write-ups and uh, large paper trail, and your job will not be uh, in any way threatened by spurious complaints to the inspector general. So as, as a result of this, uh, the use of contract is very expedient, but incredibly costly to the taxpayer. But it, 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 I agree with that. We also need to talk about direct hiring, which we've done this in McAllister and Munition Plant, which is Mr. Taylor, I was gonna ask you about that, it, because onboarding also takes forever to bring them on. People aren't gonna wait six months for a job to onboard on uh, going through the process, so direct hiring is important. But going back to this, and I'll wrap it up real quick, Mr. Chairman, it, it, if we're, we're not saving us a dollar by keeping our wages down. Uh, we're, we're, it's costing us, because we're, all we're doing is gaming the system by going out and hiring contractors to come in and do the same job because it's faster, but actually it's because we need the workforce. So we here in Congress really need to start looking at the wages that we're paying and get on scale to what it is today. I mean, look at how much wages have increased in the last four years. I mean, it is astronomically, right? And we haven't actually adjusted our pay wage at a serious look to keep up with inflation, especially with inflation being at 17%. We haven't been able to actually adjust that in over two decades almost. Is That's that absolutely correct. correct. Uh, the federal wage system is an, uh, an antiquated relic of the 70s uh, where we, we set wages in specific bins binding occupations together that no longer bear any relation to one another. Furthermore, we apply this antiquated methodology to an unrepresentative set of data that is currently connect, collected by the Department of Defense, uh, completely redundant in my personal opinion, to that already collected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which conducts a much larger and comprehensive survey of all American professions. Thank you, thank you, and Mr. Chairman, sorry about going over time. Uh, th thank you very much, Senator Mullen. Uh, Senator Shaheen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of our witnesses for being here today. I, I think most of us would agree that the federal uh, wage system is broken. It gets hung up on political ideology differences in trying to fix it, and that's the problem. Um, but I, I don't know. I think maybe it was you, Mr. Taylor, who said that we have... Um, my recollection was nine million job openings, but only six and a half million workers. Was, isn't one of the challenges that we're facing, the demographics of this country, that we are not producing because of our birthright? We don't have the number of people that we need to fill the jobs that are being created. And undoubtedly, and I, I mentioned that, that we have a birth rate problem and have had so for the last two decades. What, what comes as a surprise to people is you're talking about a post-COVID impact. Uh, during 2020 and 2021, the birth rate dropped 4%. We saw a significant, so it was already on its way down, and then it dropped, and for good reason. No one wanted to go to a hospital during that period of right. time. And on top of that, we've had the most restrictive immigration, legal immigration rates right. legal. Um, in my lifetime in the last six years or so. Yes. So that also exacerbates the problem. Um, if we could fix our broken immigration system, we would do much better in terms of having the workforce that we need. Um, but can you, one of the things I, I understand Senator Warren talked about um, how we were able to outproduce our adversaries during World War II and one of the ways was by getting women into the workforce. How can the defense industrial base better leverage women's participation? I don't know who might like to answer that. Dr. Well, the, the, the discussion with Senator Warren, which I think is exactly on this target, Senator Shaheen, was about uh, childcare and women not being able to participate in the workforce, both uh, uh, keeping the numbers down, but also meaning that, that for at a, at a important developmental part of their career, they're not in the workforce, they're not acquiring the skills, and therefore they can't move up later, including to supervisory positions. So you're, you're missing in, in a, people in a static sense, but also in a dynamic sense. Uh, childcare is clearly an issue. It's something that. Um, I appreciate having had three children and having a challenge with childcare for the 30 years that they were at home. But I think we've got a bigger problem in that um, as I've um, visited schools that young girls are not um, 
as engaged in the STEM subjects as young boys are. And so for robotics competitions, for example, um, girls are much um, less likely to participate than young boys. Are there ways that we can encourage um, girls to think about those subjects that we're not already doing? Lockwood. Thank you for the question. Um, I have a young daughter at home, and she told me when she was three that when she wanted to grow up, uh, when, when she grows up, she wants to be a doctor and a mommy and a scientist, and I want that to be possible for her, so I determined I certainly was not going to quit. Um, to double down on the child care issue, uh, I, I, I do believe this is, this is a, a, a critical thing, but um, to your point, I, it's really important that the child can envision herself doing the job. Children are not going to study, they're not going to invest in things that they think are for other people. And so the broader we can make opportunities to engage in after school activities, to put the robot, to put the drone remote in the hands of all the children is a good thing. I'll also note that among the developed economies, the United States has among the shortest school day. This creates an incredible burden for all working families. Uh, there are, in many areas, good before and after programs. You don't programs. have to explain that to me. Okay. <laughs> I, so. I understand that yeah. problem. Um, to follow on Senator Rono's question about the submarine industrial base, <clears throat> excuse me, over the next 10 years, the submarine industrial base is going to need to hire nearly 100,000 trained workers at both primary construction yards and 17,000 people at vendors. Uh, to support the supply chain. Um, you talked a little bit about ways that we could encourage apprenticeships and other ways um, we could encourage uh, workers to join um, in the submarine industry. Are there ways that suppliers can also improve the labor environment for skilled workers? Well, I think it's going to take all of them. That's really interesting. This is about a human capital strategy. We can decide that we're going to open a number of shipyards or whatever we do, but ultimately, your point, well-crafted HR strategy where you say we need 100,000 people at this period of time means we will get some percentage of people from this sector, the supplier community, the government, et cetera. This requires a comprehensive strategic overview and plan. And what we've seen is there are no shortage of programs within the federal government, but they're not orchestrated and they're not specifically identified time limited, budget limited, et cetera, to get the results. In the private sector, if I said I was going to need 100,000 employees, as has often been in the companies where I've been a Fortune, uh, Fortune 500 company, CHRO, you are told five years from now, we're going to need this many of these types of employees in these geographic locales. And we build a strategy around it. That is HR at its best. And it can be done, but very intentionally. Um, the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, which is one of those four public shipyards which um, shares the border between New Hampshire and Maine, um, has taken an approach that integrates its workforce into decision making. And that has really kept um, the workers there. Um, it's really focused on working with management on good labor practices. So I would agree that's a great way to um, better keep people in the workforce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Shaheen. Senator Bud, please. Thank you, Chairman, and thank the witnesses for being here today. Um, as Senator Kane mentioned a few moments ago, uh, expanding the Pell Grant for short-term skills-based education, it's one of the quickest and the best ways to combat these later sh labor shortages that we're talking about today and the ones we've seen around the country. I think that my proposal, the Pell Act, which the House is actually taking up this week, is one of the best ways to approach expanding uh, this program. So my bill, allows a variety of educational institutions to participate in the grant program with guardrails that empower institutions to produce high demand workers for high paying jobs. And that's exactly what we need to build up our defense industrial base. Uh, so Dr. Lockwood, the need for a strong pipeline, switching gears here to cyber, um, cyber workers, uh, that need has grown exponentially uh, given the current threat environment that we're in. So a two-part question, what can the DOD learn from the private sector on recruiting and also retaining cyber talent? And simultaneously, how can the DOD better compete against the private sector for that talent pool? Thank you for the question. 
I think one of the key lessons of the private sector is that a four-year degree is not necessary. We need to enable our young people to become productive workers as soon as possible. And uh, Dr. Johnson has earlier mentioned AI-enabled training. I'll just offer that DOD already has experience with AI-enabled training, in particular in the IT field, where the Navy some years ago piloted a program to train its uh, shipboard computer technicians using an AI-assisted digital tutor. This was an incredibly effective training methodology and, can, and quickly was brought to bear uh, to skill up, in this case, an enlisted force, individuals entering without a college uh, education, and quickly make them wildly productive. Uh, the, the, not only were they very quickly trained, but the quality of their training was significantly superior to those who had gone through the traditional schooling. Um, and then, sir, I'm sorry, could you remind me of your second question? Well, how could the DOD better compete against the private sector for that talent pool? Because they're going to be using some of these same things that you're mentioning. So how can we differentiate DOD? Yes, thank you. I think one thing that the department can offer that the private sector cannot is purpose that is driven by something other than a profit motivation. Uh, to some extent, the department will not always be able to compete on wages. It can compete on purpose. I would encourage you to... Uh, develop a revolving door mindset to make it easy for workers to flow in and out of public service and private employment. Uh, right now, it's, it's more of a one-way exit than a revolving door. Uh, so making it easy to recapture that talent, uh, to, to give re-entering either service members or civilian workers uh, time uh, to, to recover their career track within the, the DOD apparatus would be, I believe, very effective. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, you know, every high school or college student with a STEM major, they're aware of all these opportunities with Google, Amazon, other, other big tech, tech firms. So do you think the Pentagon can improve its advertising or uh, public edu education on severe, uh, excuse me, on civilian career opportunities? And what recommendations, if any, would you have um, that would allow us to further increase the visibility of DOD opportunities? Thank you for the question. Um, during the time of COVID, DOD and, and its, even its industrial partners' footprint in public schools was sort of significantly curtailed and it has not recovered. I think FaceTime is very important uh, with our young people and the public schools provide an important avenue for that. So critical to uh, the defense industrial base and the DOD's civilian workforce, it's not only um, hiring talent but retaining talent, as you know. Uh, are you aware of any barriers in OPM's promotion process which could inhibit retention within the DOD civilian workforce, Dr. Lockwood? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. I will note that the, the OPM process for nearly all personnel actions is, is quite bureaucratic uh, and uh, it takes a very long time. In many cases also the, the position descriptions are outdated and perhaps not well honed for the actual work that needs to be done. And this would inhibit uh, timely promotion and advancement if candidates are being screened by OPM against outmoded job descriptions. One of the things that my colleagues have mentioned is the shipbuilding challenges, undersea um, submarine um, building challenges coming up. Um, you know, as the Navy works to expand the size of its fleet, so what incentives particular to that um, would you suggest for the Department of Defense and the manufacturing workforce um, in this particular area related to shipbuilding and undersea capabilities? Uh, any of you? We need to draw more workers into this field. So in terms of incentive programs, I think we need to fix the broken federal wage grade system and uh, compensate for these high demand skills. Uh, that there needs to be a very visible public campaign uh, to to advertise these availabilities and to really put ourselves out there and say this is critical for the national offense and let's all get after it. Great, thank you. To, 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 uh, Senator, but just very quickly to that point, we actually went to the civilian workforce and asked the question, this is broadly, right. only 46% of working American civilians have even considered the Department of Defense as employer. And when we asked them specifically why, the primary season, uh, reason that was cited was a lack of knowledge about the DOD's culture and their employer brand. Mm -hmm. So in addition to raising salaries and, and providing all sorts of benefits and talking about, the, we need to sell that this is an actual opportunity. People just don't think of doing it. They think about go to the military or not. 
Very helpful. Thank you all. Thank you, Senator Bud. Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Dr. Johnson, I appreciated uh, the focus of your testimony on the Chips and Science Act, which I uh, helped negotiate, and uh, particularly appreciated your focus on the science and economic development investment in the science portion of that bill. As you noted, while we were able to provide advanced appropriations for the Critical Chips Act programs, there are many other new programs created that are going to rely on an annual appropriations. Now, I come from uh, 15 years at the space program where we see this firsthand, but doc Dr. Johnson, can you expand upon your testimony and explain how investments in basic science and innovation can yield economic growth, even if we can't always foresee exactly how those investments will pay off? Uh, yes, Senator. So as, as you know, this was a big revelation to the U.S. actually from the 1940s, and it came out of the, the, the war effort, accelerated by Sputnik and, and then the creation of the, the space program. And what we've come to understand, and now there's a, a lot of data on this, which is it summarized in my testimony, we have a, a whole book on this topic, is that when you put money into basic science, you generate a whole range of ideas, many of which you don't... Uh, expect to, to, to see. And then you, if you have a process of channeling that into specific applications, the space program would be one public purpose program. But there's many other commercializations, including everything that's brought to digital computers and the internet, for, for example, and mobile telecommunications. That, that machinery that we have in the United States is actually pretty strong, the private sector piece. But the private sector does not invest enough in basic science because it's all about the spillover effects. It's all about all those unexpected effects, it's all about being able to you know, suddenly invent a vaccine because you've got a new disease you had never heard of before, but you have that capability, and so on. And so the federal commitment to science is, is fundamental to our economic prosperity, but, but also, Mr. Chairman, to our national security, because this is what we've been very good at. This is what's propelled us forward in many ways, and this is what China has learned from us and what they're doubling down on now. So we have to invest more just to stay up with them. I think we can even better than is that. It, is it true? I, I was always of the understanding that the private sector is not going to invest in something that has a return on investment that goes beyond five years. I don't know if that number is is the, the the number you go go by, and that's why it's up to the federal government to be making these basic science investments because private sector just can't can't do it if they're not going to see a return on the money. It, it can be about time horizon. I think much more is about spill spill effects. So the Human Genome Project, for example, was shopped around some private venture capitalists in the 1980s. They turned it down because they said, "Look, great project. You're going to create a lot of knowledge, but we won't be able to capture the value of that in in ourselves. It'll be general knowledge." So the Human Genome Project was funded, as you know, by the federal government. Massive success. 300,000 jobs uh, created. Tremendously strong industry. Powers a big part of our economy and produces uh, drugs, uh, therapies, and vaccines that, that are essential to every part of everybody in, the, in this country. Right. But he needed that public impetus. And this, of course, is what the National Institutes of Health does really well. But we need more of that, and we need more of that across more sectors. Well, somebody who was always trying to sell our space program, what I would you know, stress is it's not, you know, it wasn't about like a product like Velcro. It was about creating industries, industries that no longer existed. I mean, our aerospace industry here in the United States has been a become a big part of our economy. Um, and that didn't exist before, you know, the 1960s, really. So um, from a national security perspective, what opportunities, I want to connect this to the CHIPS and Science Act, so what opportunities are we missing by not fully funding the CHIPS and Science Act um, because this could be really a, a long overdue and historic investment in American research and innovation. Oh, it's a breakthrough piece of legislation, absolutely, Senator, that, that, that taps into what was done previously in the 40s and with the space program, but goes much further. And it is a little bit painful that the appropriation has not followed through. So Congress recognized the opportunity and I think agreed on a very broad bipartisan basis, but you've got to put some money into it. Then, Senator, I think the question becomes what next? Where are the next sectors where we want the breakthroughs? What's the next equivalent of satellites, next equivalent of the, of the internet, next equivalent of mobile communications. There's a lot of opportunities in biomanufacturing. There's a lot of opportunities in other parts of, of semiconductors. There's opportunities in critical minerals, for example. There's a long list, and, and I think Congress needs to engage with that. And I think you should be thinking about CHIPS and Science Act 2.0 after, of course, you fund the, th the first version. Yeah, I had other, you know, some questions that led to, you know, STEM education. But I, I look at basic science and STEM education as being sort of like kind of in the same bucket. You know, this is like the, the, the seed corn for 
you know, it's the catalyst for what grows the economy, both education and investment in science. So thank you. The National Defense Education Act, I remember, in 1958, and NASA, the two big reactions to Sputnik, they were both brilliant moves by Congress, Senator. So I'm sure we can do it again. Well, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of questions for the record. Uh, we'll accept those, Senator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Dr. Johnson, I wanted to, to kind of explore um, uh, your idea of the, these tech hubs. <clears throat> I'm from St. Louis area, and, and St. Louis has been identified, and there's a lot of assets there. So you've got NGA, you've got the Taylor Institute there. Um, there's a lot of uh, alignment um, that can be a draw. Um, one of the challenges, I think, as we talk about workforce, is there's, there is a bit of a, there is a misalignment in, in, in higher education, right? You've got a lot of four years that chase degrees for enrollment. You've got community colleges trying to figure out where they fit in. You've got these apprenticeship programs that, as you mentioned in your opening comments, maybe sometimes are, are limited to what they, that particular company might need. So with that as sort of the backdrop, how does this actually work? Because I'm, I'm intrigued by this, and I think it's an, an encouraging idea. Uh, we do need to have, I think, an industrial base that's more widely dispersed. Uh, we've talked about, you know, the dangers in our supply chain. And so let's just take let's just take St. Louis as an example. It could be anywhere. It could be in Rhode Island or somewhere else. How does this actually work? How do we get in, ten, you know, five to ten years a place where somebody who wants to work on nuclear submarines, so not necessarily just the engineer that's got the four-year degree, how does this work? How does the alignment work in a tech hub? So St. Louis is a fascinating example, Senator, in part because you were one of the country's leading tech hubs right. 100, 120 years ago, right? And, and one very unfortunate thing that happened, and I don't have any particular person to blame on this, is that as innovation moved to east and west coast, it, it, you got less innovation, less corporate headquarters in St. Louis, but not for any particularly good reason, right? I mean, people have got strange reasons like the way where airline routes went and so on, but it, it's not, you've got a lot of talent. The talent can't move, doesn't want to move, shouldn't need to move. I think tying it to uh, the, my answer to Senator Kelly, if we have, if Congress has, and if the relevant agencies have priority sectors to pursue and places that are available, including with state and local support, which would be making sure the workforce develops. Senator Scott made very good points about that. Also available housing, I would say, Mr. Senator Schmidt. So, so it's not, you're, you're not um, adding 10,000 workers, but they have nowhere to live, so the price of housing goes up, and that means you've got to pay them a high wage or they just won't come. So I think that looking for that combination, and I, I think St. Louis scores very highly in, in our metrics because it seems to us that you have exactly that kind of combination of circumstances. But we, we found 102 places in 36 states that have potential. And honestly, a country this size, with science being so important to our economy and to our national defense, we should be running a massive portfolio of these deep science investments, looking for ways to commercialize them, getting those public-private partnerships with state and local support, but the federal government is the, is the catalyst. Without the federal government, you're not going to be able to move the needle. And we've done it before, and, and, and you agreed to do it again in the Chips and Science Act. So that's, from, a, from your answer there, that seems like that's, an, that's a research investment side. But on the, on the workforce piece, I, I'm genuinely curious. So let's say I'm a 17-year-old <clears throat> in high school, and um, you know, I, don't, I, wanted, I want to pursue this path where you know, I, there's some immediate opportunities. What does that look like, or, or what should it look like for that individual to try to navigate to get to a place where we want to be in, 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 within that tech hub? So Senator Scott talked about workforce planning at the state level. I think it's better done at state and local than at the federal level, where he was matching up incoming investment or, or defense contractors who said, we're going to need this kind of jobs over this many years. He was matching that up with people coming out of the high schools, I think in particular high schools and the technical colleges. I think that's exactly the right thing to, to do, Senator. Uh, I think that apprenticeships are undervalued by the private sector because you lose the you train the apprentice, the apprentice leaves, so the private company doesn't want to do it. But from a public policy point of view and from a St. Louis point of view, more people who've completed apprenticeships is good for your local economy, particularly if they don't want to move or are not inclined to move to the east and west coast. Then you've got this very strong trained labor force, including with the middle skills that we've all been emphasizing and agreeing on. And I think this is a this this is a completely bipartisan consensus across the country, as I, when I talk to people, it's not politicized at all. Everybody wants something in this direction. The federal government, though, is the critical catalyst. And then deciding which sectors and lining it up with the defense industrial base, that's a brilliant piece to add. Because if we, if we know that submarines are important, or if we know that aircraft are a certain kind of important, then, then, and you know there's going to be a 20-year commitment to that from a national security point of view, then you can plan a lot more activities around that, including the location for those innovations. Yeah, I mean, if, if you guys have anything to add to, yeah. Yes, Senator. The, the, the reality is, if I'm going to use the example of that 17-year-old, first of all, he or she needs to know what the opportunities are. 
So I'm sitting out in Florissant or wherever I am, and I just don't even know what the possibilities are by virtue of my background. And then we've got to specifically articulate a pathway that may not and oftentimes doesn't require a four-year college degree. It could be that, young man, if you do this for six months, this could prepare you for an apprenticeship that could get you this job, et cetera. So we literally, the biggest problem that we're hearing from young people is they, they understand what the government says it needs or what our country says it needs. They just don't know the pathway to get there. So educating, you know, old school guidance counselors, like, right, everyone's not going to college, you may be going to the workforce. This is how you prepare yourselves for that. Those are the two most important things as we're hearing from younger uh, potential workers, and we talk to high school students a lot, and they're like, listen, I know what I think I want to do, that sounds interesting. And if you can pay me 35 bucks an hour at 20 years old, why not, without debt, right. in college, yeah. et cetera, I just don't know how that works. So articulating to the future workforce how it all works will go a long way towards solving for these talent challenges. Bring back shop class. Let them work with their hands. Let them build things, let them tinker, let them print things with a 3D printer. Let them be creative. They can see then that there's a path for me to do these, these mid-skill jobs, that there's dignity in that, that the country needs that, it's valued. And in that shop class, you can make the pitch. Spring back civics and shop class. <laughs> Let's do it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Schmidt. Uh, Senator Blumenthal, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, shop class is good. I don't know about in the era of AI, artificial intelligence, how many shop class uh, enlistees there will be, uh, but maybe the nature of shop class should be changed. Uh, I want to engage in kind of a thought experiment. I'm the CEO of Electric Boat. As you know, Electric Boat in Connecticut makes the most capable and reliable submarines in the world. And if you look at employment patterns at Electric Boat, they have mountains and troughs. The reason they have mountains and troughs is that the Pentagon often changes procurement requirements. We want two submarines a year. No, Virginia class, we want one sub, maybe one plus the Columbia class, plus, you know, if you're a manufacturer, pretty hard to engage in recruiting, hiring, training. Training involves investment when those procurement commitments are changing. And just to mention the elephant in the room, right now we have no budget for this fiscal year. So the Pentagon is kind of scratching its head and saying, okay, we think we know what the budget's gonna be. Chairman Reed has done extraordinarily skilled and excellent work in passing the National Defense Authorization Act, which provides a basic contour for what procurement should be, but the money has to be approved. To what extent does this indecision by the Congress and by the Pentagon indecision and reversal of decisions affect the ability to recruit, train, and hire a workforce like Electric Boat? The workers will go somewhere else. They're not gonna sit around and wait for us to get our act together. They have families to feed. So unless we can really maintain the continuity of that production pipeline, which I agree we desperately need, uh, we will struggle to retain. And the prospect of that, even the prospect of potentially not knowing. So the idea of not knowing, uh, employers, employees are voting with their feet. So even if you have the employee, they're currently working in these industries, this level of indecision gives them a um, anxiety that will often lead them to come to the private sector because they're like, at least there, I kind of know what I, can, what I know. Senator, I, I completely agree with where you're going and what my colleagues just said, but I would also remind everyone that the V-12 Merlin engine that powered the Spitfire and the Hurricane in World War II and was decisive for keeping Germany out of Britain started to develop in 1929 before there was any public procurement guidelines for that engine. There was a private sector innovation, Senator, and what you really need in this country is not just better organized procurement exactly as you're wanting. You need people who are pushing on the innovative frontier for the new stuff that Pentagon's not, doesn't even know they want yet. 
right? And so how do we incentivize that? How do we, how do we encourage that? How do we build the skills? And I think the shop class has never been more important, Senator, because I think losing those manual skills, losing our thinking with our hands is a huge disadvantage when we think about the world. Because the engineers who built the Merlin, who built the Spitfire, who built, who built the American effort in World War II were very hands-on people, weren't they? Uh, they understood how to bend metal. And, and that's the key to, to a lot of these uh, innovations that we're talking about. You know, I, I think what you're saying about shop class, which is not just what happens in the classroom, but the manual skills and the instinctive approach to how to put things together and make them work. That's what Electric Boat is trying to hire. The welders, the electricians, the pipe fitters, people who are skilled at the trades. And not only in shop class, but frankly in high school, I think we need to do a better job of selling people, future workers, on the idea, you know, you can have not just a job, but a career, a real career making a lot more money than, let's say, my four children. They were all educated liberal arts institutions. Three of them are lawyers, uh, like me. But uh, there are a lot more lawyers per person, maybe, than there need to be. And we need more of the folks who can do the work at Electric Boat with the careers that really provide not just financial gratification, but real dignity, the dignity of work. You're nodding, so I assume you agree. Dr. Lockwood said it already, sorry. Dr. Lockwood said it, I totally agree. Dignity and status and purpose, but you've got to also pay people good money, right? Because people have to live, and that's a question of how much you pay them relative to what it costs to live in, in, in the areas that you're trying to develop. But if you get that right, which we have done in this country before, Senator Blumenthal, and, and you've got very strong obviously uh, places in Rhode Island and, and in Connecticut that also get this right, then, then we, can, we can do incredible things. Senator, I, there's... I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, go Mr. Ahead. Taylor. Yes, I would just submit to you that we oftentimes talk about and believe that our talent pool must come from the K through 12 system. We increasingly have that middle group, that middle 45 to 55 year old who is now displaced, wants to work. You want to talk about dignity of work. And so many of our training programs disproportionately focus on young people. And that's good, but we're ignoring that there's a significant swath of the population that is available, wants that dignity of work, needs to do it, and we don't provide reskilling and upskilling programs from the government, frankly, to them. We'll give you Pell Grant all day for the kid, but what happens to that 45-year-old whose job has been significantly changed on the account of technology, and they could become a welder, but themselves don't know how to do that and don't think there's a pathway to that. So I would not ignore that significant portion of our population that wants to work but doesn't know how to reskill. Uh, I thank you all for your insights. And um, by the way, Chairman Reed and I uh, have just come back from a trip to Ukraine. And the Ukrainians are taking what seem to be often very low-tech drones. And because they have those manual skills, they're able to reconfigure them. I don't know what the technical term would be, and make them lethal. Now, they still need arms. They need support. They need the resources. They are sadly lacking, and we need to give it to them in the supplemental that's now before the House that we passed here in the Senate. But they have been extraordinarily innovative and creative because they have many of those manual skills. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, and thank you for your, in, not just participation today, but for your uh, willingness to travel to Ukraine and to do so many other things. But. Uh, this has been a very, very helpful and useful panel. Uh, I would like to just touch on, again, on something that was mentioned, but that is that the perception of working for either the Department of Defense or a defense company uh, seems to be very negative. And um, that is an issue we have to deal with. And let me just quickly, Mr. Taylor, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Lockwood. Yes, we actually, I don't, at the end of the day, it is 
far more attractive to most employers. They know of the brands, name them, I won't go the contract. You know, it's Lockheed Martin, Boeing, et cetera. That is a far more attractive opportunity to them than, and they don't even think about the opportunities as I know half of uh, the American civil, the civil, civilian workforce has said they don't think about the Department of Defense proper. So to the extent that we could create, this is what the job is. It doesn't matter if it's that Department of Defense or the rest of the industry. Industrial base, I think we could solve for some of the problems. Private sector has a one-up on the government those roles. It's a very interesting problem that you're articulating, Senator, because I do think serving the armed forces is still prestigious and, and, and sought after. I served in the military when I was young, not in this country, unfortunately. I did register for selective service when I was eligible. I got turned down because I was slightly too old, which is disappointing. But, but I, I, I think the reason for that, and, and, and those were regarded as, as good things, and I was, those were great experiences. And I think that's because we have this perception and correct understanding that you, you build skills in, in those military roles. And somehow, it, and perhaps it's about the, the, the wage classification system which is always articulated. I'm not, I'm not saying that there, isn't, there aren't deep structural problems, but somehow that same prestige, that same um, conviction that you're building le leadership. We have great students in our MBA classes who are former military, for example. And, and, and who are terrific leaders, and everybody automatically assumes that's what you get if you're bringing a, a lieutenant or a captain into an MBA program. Um, and somehow that's not coming across in the defense industrial base. And I think that, I think Dr. Lockwood's got some very good ideas, about, and, and as, as do you, Senator, about how to fix that. But I think the way you articulate it just in, in those terms is exactly right. Thank you. Dr. Lockwood, please. Yes, um, I, I think it is to some extent about prestige. It's also about what people know about. I'll note that uh, there's been a great consolidation in the military footprint. Uh, when you ask young people, do you know a veteran, fewer than ever say yes. Uh, so we just need to be out there in the community. We need to say that this is not someone else's duty. This is not something I can outsource. This is our responsibility as, as all Americans uh, to participate in some way in making sure that our, our country and, and you know, that of our allies uh, is safe. Uh, so I, I think if we couch it as a community responsibility and if we put ourselves out there in new ways that both our partners in the industrial base and our defense civilian workforce uh, can get more of the attention that it, that it rightly deserves. Thank you. Well, thank you all for excellent testimony. And as I said initially, this is not the, uh, a one stop. Uh, we look forward to your collaboration and and your input too. If there are issues that we're not dealing with hope, or we should be dealing with or there's advice you can give us, don't hesitate, please. Thank you very much. With that, I will adjourn the hearing.